And I'll tell Dean Ortega to talk about those topics, but I'll try to talk about them because you will only have three or four here anyway. Now look. Uh, there is one topic under witnesses which I noticed has not been in the bar exams for a long time already. It's the uh, parent and filial privilege rule in, in section 25. Just take it easy. In a few minutes, we'll be over. You go to church, you pray, you go home, you sleep, you have your gimmick, you wake up tomorrow, you study at noon. Okay? No. And be happy. You enjoy. Especially those of you who come from the provinces, you enjoy Manila. <laughs> Yung konting konti lang na enjoyment, you enjoy Manila. There are many beautiful places here, but do not linger along Claro M. Recto up to the Visoria. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you might wind up losing your cell phones, your wallet. I cannot protect you now because the old guards, the leaders of the bad boys around are already dead. They are the persons I know. Uh, I used to tell them, kung gusto ninyong manghold up, huwag naman dito sa tapat ng San Sebastian hanggang sa UE, wag. Eh, saan kami pupunta? Oh, utol. Utol ang tawag sa akin eh. Doon kayo sa Espanya. <laughs> Nawawa naman. <laughs> sa Espanya, hindi ko sinabi sa UST ah. <laughs> May mga UST dito eh. Sa Espanya kayo. Eh, patay na yung dalawa. Kaya yung mga puno nila, hindi ko na akilala. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> you know, can a parent testify against a child or a descendant? Oh yes, of course, but he cannot be compelled. Can a child testify against a parent or an ascendant? Oh, yes, but he cannot be compelled. But with respect to the child, uh, Rule 25 has been modified by the family code. If you have a family code in section or article 215, 215. Under that provision, while, let's say, a child cannot be compelled to testify as a rule following the rules of court against a parent or a grandparent, there is an instance when he can be compelled to testify under the family code. When? If his 215 family code, huh? if his testimony is indispensable indispensable where in a crime committed against him meaning the child or in a crime committed by one parent against another parent in that case where the crime is committed against him by a descendant or against a parent by another parent and the testimony of that child is indispensable. He can be required to testify. So, Section 25 has been modified by Article 215 of the Family Code with respect to a child. Has that been asked in the bar exams? The answer is no. If you go to 26, etc., blah, 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 we noticed we took that up this morning in relation to admissions, is it not? Now, let me tell you one of the most important rules. One of the most important rules in the rule of evidence starts in section 36. Section 36 is actually the Philippine version of the hearsay evidence rule. Section 36 of Rule 130. Hey, look at this. I will tell you the actual meaning of hearsay evidence, all right? And you look at the exceptions because there are two exceptions that will be considered for the bar. Section 37 and 42. That will be the bar in case there will be a question. The others are codal. 
I will be here during Dean Ortega's lecture. So, if he stops two hours before his time, I may come in, okay, and talk about certain matters. But Dean Ortega, he will not stop. Hey. The basic meaning of the Philippine hearsay rule is you cannot testify based on the knowledge of another. You have to testify based on your personal knowledge. That's the basic rule. But it is a shortcut of the American rule from where we borrowed the hearsay evidence rule. So let me illustrate the classic example first, okay? The classic example. Before we go to a version. When I say version, the proper version. Mr. Ordonez, what is this? Ah, oh, okay. This is the table of the judge. Okay. Here is the witness stand. Okay. Here is the audience. Okay, the people. In traditional American courts and English courts, which is no longer strictly followed in America, there is a railing here. A railing. The audience has no right to come here. Only lawyers will be inside the railing together with the judge. Because the judge and the lawyers are lawyers. But the public, even the clerk of court, let's say he is not a lawyer, court personnel, they will be outside the bar, but on that side. Because that's the origin of our exams, passing the bar, crossing the bar. Before you can come here, you must pass that bar. Take an exam, so you cross the bar. You take the bar examinations. That's the origin in England. So you will now become lawyers. You know already the meaning of passing the bar. See, there is a bar. Miharang. Before you can come in here, you must cross the bar, cross over the bar. But you have to take an exam and pass it. Okay. The witness here is, let's say, W. Let's give him a name. Let's call him William. Before he goes to court, months, 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 Pedro talked to William. Pedro said, Jose shot Mario. I saw it with my two big eyes. Question, who has personal knowledge? Pedro. Who is supposed to testify in court? Answer, Pedro, because he is the one with a personal perception. But did he tell every detail of the incident of what he witnessed to William? Yes. So what Pedro knows, William also knows. So Pedro received the subpoena to testify. To testify against Jose, who now stands indicted for homicide. On the day of the trial, while Pedro was going to court, he suddenly suffered from extreme chest pains. In 10 minutes, he was dead. He suffered from a massive heart attack. But again, he managed to recite results, mi ultimo adios, but he's dead. Okay. 
The prosecutor was informed of the death of Pedro by William. And William said, Mr. Prosecutor, everything Pedro knows, I know. So, he was offered as a witness to prove that it was really Jose who shot Mario. Okay? Remember the purpose of his testimony. Your Honor, the testimony of William is offered to prove that it was indeed Jose who shot and killed Mario. During the trial, he was asked, Why are you here, Mr. William? To testify that it was Jose who shot Mario. Kamali ng tanong ang prosecutor. Sumunod na tanong, medyo mali. How did you know it was Jose who shot Mario? Because, sir, my good friend Pedro, who never tells a lie in his life, told me so. What would you expect the defense counsel to do? I move to strike out the testimony and move for the discharge of the person because he will only testify on hearsay evidence which is not allowed by the rules. In most probability, the court will say, you son of a bitch, you step out here, you will only tell the court something you do not know. But the court will not say those bad words. This is just for emphasis. Okay? Why? He is not supposed to testify. Incompetent, Your Honor? No personal knowledge. Yan. But then before he stepped out, Your Honor, that was a slip of the tongue. That is not really the very purpose for which I am testifying here. I am only testifying, Your Honor, as to what Pedro told me before he died. Whether it is true or not, I do not know. Gusto ko lang malaman ninyo kung anong sinabi niya sa akin. He is only going to testify as to the tenor of the statement, not as to the truth of the statement of Pedro to him. Wala akong pakialam po. Kung totoo ang sinabi niya, ang gusto ko lang patunayan dito ay kung anong narinig ko na sinabi ni Pedro sa akin. That's not hearsay. Because it is not offered to prove the truth of what Pedro told him. If it is offered for the truth of what Pedro told him, it is hearsay. You know why? Because pag tinanong siya, anong nakit, anong nangyari? Bakit binaril? Papanong pagbaril? Sagot lang niya ganito, ang sabi ni Pedro, ganito ang nangyari. Ano pa? Ang sabi ni Pedro, Nung nahandusay na si Mario sa sugat sa dibdib, nilapitan pa, tinutukan pa sa noo at sa kabinaril pa uli. Pagkatapos po, dinuran pa. Pagkatapos kumuha pa ng lanseta at hiniwa ang tiyan. Paano mo nalaman yan? Sabi po ni Pedro, alam mong nangyari? Hindi po, sabi lang po ni Pedro. Eh, paano mo yan makrosexamine? Wala siyang personal knowledge. Ang sagot niya, sabi ni Pedro, ganito. Sabi ni Pedro, ganyan. Kaya nga ayaw ng rules ng hearsay. Because the testimony is unreliable. See? It's unreliable. Pero pag ang purpose niya is to testify only as to what he heard, ano narinig mo? Ganito ang narinig ko. Anong sinabi niya? Ganito ang sinabi niya. Totoo ba yan? Anong malay ko? Pero totoo na may narinig ako. Pero kung yung narinig ko totoo, ay hindi ko alam kung totoo yun. Pero totoo na may sinabi sa akin. Ganitong sinabi, he has personal knowledge. That is not hearsay. So, hindi lahat ng out-of-court statements na inulit mo sa hukuman ay hearsay. Tanungin mo muna ang purpose. Ngayon, kung yung narinig mo relevant sa kaso, ang tawag doon ay independently relevant statement. Independently relevant irrespective of the truth. 
what is important is the tenor of the statement that it was said. Dahil meron siyang personal knowledge ng kanyang narinig. Wala siyang personal knowledge ng katotohanan ng kanyang narinig. Yan ang tunay na meaning ng hearsay. Okay, halimbawa, may isang kaso na ang issue ay yung kung halimbawa ang kapatid kong lalaki na kaisa-isa ay buhay pa as of April 19, 2002. Okay? Gusto kong patunayan na buhay pa ang aking kapatid noong araw na yon. Issue sa case yan. Tinanong ako, nakausap mo ba ang iyong, oh, kailan mo nakausap, huling nakausap ang kapatid mo? Noong umaga po ng April 19, 2002, Anong oras? Mga alas 7.30 po ng umaga. Paano mo siya nakausap? Eh, tumawag po sa akin sa telepono. Saan ka ba noong araw na yon? Ako po ay nasa bahay ko sa Quezon City. Nasaan ang kapatid mo? Nasa Romblon po. Paano mo nalaman na siya ay tumatawag sa Romblon? Kasi po, nare-reflect sa telepono ko ang number. At ang number na na-reflect ay ang bahay namin sa Romblon, kung saan ang kapatid ko. At ang sabi ng kapatid ko pa ay, Kuya, nandito ako sa Romblon, tiningnan ko ang number, totoo nga. Okay. Ano bang pinag-usapan nyo? Eh, nangungumusta kung ano na nangyayari sa akin sa Maynila at hindi ako pumupunta doon. Okay. Yun lang ba ang sinabi niya? Meron po. Sinabi niya, Kuya, umuulan ng yelo ngayon dito sa Romblon. Kahit na summer. Sigaw ng kalaban, Objection! Hearsay! It is his brother who should testify in court. Riano, the witness, has no personal knowledge about that event na umuulan ng yelo sa rumblon noong araw na yon. Ang magaling na judge, hindi magrurul, magtatanong. Ano ba ang purpose? Na pinapasok mo rito ang testimony ng kapatid mo na wala naman dito sa korte. Ang purpose ko po ay ganito. Para patunayan sa inyo na nung araw na yon talagang nagkaroon ng yelo sa rumblon kahit mainit ang araw, kahit summer. Aba, hearsay. Because I have no personal knowledge tungkol sa yelo. Yun ay galing lang sa informasyon sa kapatid ko. To prove the truth of the fact that may yelo nga, hearsay. Pero ganitong sagot ko. Sinabi ko po sa inyo rito sa hukuman ang sinabi ng kapatid ko na umuulan ng yelo noong April 19, 2002 sa Romblon kahit summer at mainit ang araw para patunayan ko sa inyo na buhay ang kapatid ko noong araw na yon dahil kung hindi buhay, hindi siya makapagkwento sa akin tungkol sa pagulan ng yelo. Hindi hearsay. Dahil ang purpose ay iba. Anong sa inyo, Judge? Gusto niyo pa ng isang purpose? Para patunayan sa inyo na nung araw na yon, the phone lines between Romblon and Quezon City were working. If they are relevant to the case, that's okay. Ang objection mo lang doon kung relevant o irrelevant. Pero hindi hearsay. Oh, nakuha nyo na? Yan. Yan ang meaning ng hearsay. Tandaan nyo yan pag nag-practice na kayo. The court will respect you if you know the meaning of hearsay. You can even say, Your Honor, could you give me the privilege to deliver a 15-minute lecture on the meaning of hearsay? Look at this na lang, ha? Nagalit talaga ako, ha? Kunyari, dahil sa... Nung nabasa ko ang will ng aming lola, kami magkapatid na lang ang tanging mga relatives ng lola namin na namatay. He, wala nang ibang dapat puntahan pa ang property niya sa amin dalawa na lang. 
Nakita ko sa will, sa free portion, subject to disposition, is it not? Eh, may legitim kami. Pero yung free portion, yun ang akin tinitingnan. Dahil free yun eh. Aba? 100 hectares of rice land to my brother. One hundred square meters to Willard Riano. <laughs> Description. Stony area. No commercial value. Gusto kong mabali wala yung part na yon ang will. Get my point? Gusto ko mapunta sa amin ng intestate succession na lang para parehas. Ano ngayon ang gagawin ko? Patunayan ko na ang lola ko, nung ginawa ang will, si Raulo. Para, hindi ma-probate ang will. Is it not? Okay. Yan. Tandaan mo, ang punto ko ay, para patunayan na ang lola ko ay may, con may di malaking diferensya. <laughs> hindi ba't malaking diferensya yan? 100 square meters akin, mabato pa. Sa kapatid ko, 100 square, 100 hectares? Rice land? Ano ba yan? Okay. Sa probate ng will, tinawag ako as witness. Ay, ang will ay signed and executed together with the instrumental witnesses on April 1, 2005. Okay? Tanong sa akin ngayon ang lawyer ko, Will Adriano, have you spoken to your grandmother on or immediately before April 1? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, when did you speak to her? On April 1. What time? At around 6.30 in the morning. Could you tell us the circumstances? Well, at around 6 o'clock in the morning, she called me up and said, Anak, dalawin mo naman ako. Uh, samahan mo ko sa almusal by 6.30. Okay, pasusundo kita na sa sakyan para tayo mag-usap. Okay. Do you know, Willard Riano, that the will was executed, signed, and authorized, signed by the witnesses in the evening of April 1? Well, I do not know that. But all I know is that at 6.30 in the morning, we were eating our breakfast. Can you recall, if any, anything that occurred while you were eating your breakfast with your grandmother? She pulled me aside secretly, she said. I was even surprised because there was no other person why she had to pull me as if in secret. And she told me, Meron akong sasabihin sa'yo, secret. You know how old I am? I'm 82, she said. So, Lola, ano secret doon? Ay talaga namang matanda na kayo. Ay hindi yan. Kilala mo ba si John F. Kennedy, yung dating president ng, ng America na assassinated on November 23, 1963? Opo, hindi mo ba alam, dati kong boyfriend yun? Ibig sabihin, Lola, pumunta kayo sa Amerika? Oo, na-meet ko siya sa Massachusetts. Eh, Lola, hindi naman kayo umaalis ng Pilipinas eh. Yan ang akala mo, I travel incognito. Ah, oh, ganun. Naalala mo yung Prime Minister of England nung panahon ng Falklands War when there was a war between Great Britain and Argentina? Yeah, si Margaret Thatcher po, yung Prime Minister. Oh, galing mo pala sa memory, no? Hindi, nabasa ko lang, oh. Nabalutan yung jari yung yun, ang tinapa noon, kaya binasa ko. Si Was, and si Is, my first cousin. Eh, Pinoy na Pinoy kayo, lole. Eh, yun ay British. Kaya nga sinasabi ko sa'yo, sikreto, eh. Ma lola pala, malami para kayo yung sikreto. Meron pang isa, anak. Apo, meron pang isa. Di ba? Namatay si Saddam Hussein, na-execute. Opo, boyfriend ko rin yun. Ah, okay. Am um, I presenting those statements of my lola to prove that she was indeed the friend of Margaret Thatcher? No. To prove that she was the boyfriend of John F. Kennedy? No. To prove that she was the boyfriend of Saddam Hussein? No. But to prove something else, this one, it's not hearsay.
General rule here say evidence is not admissible because the person who has personal knowledge cannot be cross-examined effectively in court. Okay? That's the reason. That's the last question on hearsay by way of essay. Why is hearsay evidence not admissible, answer, unreliable? The person who has personal knowledge cannot be cross-examined in open court. And the truth cannot come out if the one who is in court has no personal knowledge and his personal knowledge is zero, silks, nothing. Now, are there exceptions to the hearsay rule? Yes. I want you to remember that when we talk about exceptions to the hearsay rule, we are talking about exceptions which are actually hearsay. Alam niyo kung bakit kailangan kong sabihin to? Dahil may nagtanong sa akin yan eh. Last year, isang bar review eh. Haba ako yung naglalakad. Sir, yun bang exception sa hearsay rule ay hindi na yun hearsay, sir? Very honest ng tanong. Maganda yung tanong niya kasi naguguluan siya. Sabi ko, hindi. Ang exception sa the hearsay rule, lahat sila ay hearsay. Kaya nga exception siya. Ang rule ay, ang hearsay, hindi pwede tanggapin kung objekan mo. Kaya lang, May mga hearsay na pwedeng tanggapin. Yun ang exceptions. Dahil kung hindi hearsay, hindi exceptions. Nakuha niyo ako? Baguhin natin ang explanation. Ang hearsay, inadmissible. Pero may mga hearsay na admissible. Yung admissible hearsay, yun ang exceptions. Yan ang rule. Okay na ba tayo? Yan. Sabi ko nga sa inyo kahapon, kung minsan, kailangan mong tanggapin ang hearsay dahil wala ka namang personal knowledge ng lahat sa mundo. For convenience, may mga bagay na reliable na hindi mo maitatatwa na malaki ang bahid ng katotohanan kaya hindi mo dapat i-reject. Dahil kung ipagpipilitan mo na lahat ng sabihin mo ay personal knowledge mo, Aba, walang mangyayari sa mundo. Look at this. Yung sinabi ko sa inyo kahapon. Hindi na kayo tatawa ngayon dahil tapos na kayong tumawa kahapon. Pero, kung sinabi ko, ang babaeng yan ay kapatid ko. Para malaman mo at may personal knowledge ka na ang babaeng yan ay kapatid mo, dapat ay nandung ka nung ginawa siya ng magulang mo. Nandung ka sa bawat stage ng kanyang fetal development. Nandung ka nung lumabas siya sa sinapupuna ng nanay mo. Ah, hindi lang yon. Dapat, namalayan mo rin na galing ka sa nanay mo. Paano mo malayan yon? Ay, hindi mo alam yon. Paano mo alam na anak ka ng tatay mo? Sinabi sa'yo. Nino? Nang tatay mo. Nang nanay mo. Lumaki ka. Nanay, tatay, papa, mama, dad, mom. Pupsi. Mumsi. Yan si. But we admit those things. They are parts or declaration on pedigree, relationship. Because you see birth certificates, you see family Bibles, family history, family records. They're admissible. If you do not admit them, wala kang kapatid sa mundo. Ni wala kang magulang na may tuturing kung ipagpilitan mong personal knowledge ang lahat. Pare, Ganda ng monumentong yan, ano? Sino yan? Si Jose Rizal. Born on June 19, 1861. Calamba, Laguna. Assassinated December 30, 1896, 7.30. Bagong bayan. Niwala ako sa'yo. Ba't buhay ka na ba nun? See? Admissible yun, yeah. Common reputation yun eh. Kung mabasa mo sa libro, 
learned treatises. Okay, ako ay accountant ng isang company. Alam ko lahat ng receivables at payables. You know what I mean, is it not? Okay. Alam ko kung sino may utang sa kumpanya. At ang aming negosyo ay construction materials. May isang tao na may utang ng dalawang milyong piso, hindi pa nagbabayad. So, idinimanda ng kumpanya for collection. Sinong dapat mag-testify tungkol sa utang niya na may personal knowledge? Ako! Akong may knowledge eh. Kasama pa nga ako sa nag-deliver ng materials. Nakita ko ng pinirma niya ang receipt ng materials. Ako ang naglagay sa dokumento sa, sa opisina. Eh, nung ako ay magte-testify na, namatay ako. Dito, kasi kahoy ito eh. Knock and wood. So, may bagong accountant. Pwede bang mag-testify ang bagong accountant tungkol sa utang nung dinimanda ng kumpanya? Yes. Based on the entries of the business records. Kung tutuusin, wala siyang personal knowledge. You get my point? But she could testify based on those. That is for convenience. Ay kung hindi mo papayagan Ano, gigisingin mo sa kanyang grave yung accountant na may personal knowledge. Gising ka muna. Saka ka na bumalik dyan. Pag nakatestify ka, hindi pwede yun. See, the rules are very reasonable. Very reasonable. Are you okay? Yan. You cannot teach history. You cannot teach physics. You cannot teach any science if you demand personal knowledge. Paano mo ma-explain with personal knowledge ang gravity? Kailang nasa loob ka ng gravitational pull. Paano yon? So you have to do it on the basis of authoritative statements. Again, learned treatises. 1 plus 1 equals 2. Paano mo nalaman yun? Ano yun? 1 plus 1 equals 2. Pero tinatanggap ba natin na 1 plus 1 equals 2? Yes. That's of common knowledge. Okay. Pag-ingatan nyo ang section 37. Dying declaration. It is not a declaration of a person who died. It's a declaration of a person before he died. While he was dying. Not after he died. Oh, I read that in an exams test. After he died, the person said something. Oh, Jesus Maria Joseph. <laughs> Alam ko, sleep of the pen yun. <laughs> it, yung sleep of the pen, that it, it really gave me a kick. You know, I got a kick out of it. Again, that guy is already a lawyer. You see that? After failing in civil procedure three times, he became a lawyer. Did you have failing grades in college, in the law school? Oh yes, that's normal. That's normal. And usually, yung maraming bagsak, naging abogado yan eh. Dahil meron na silang masteral degree sa commercial law, meron ng doctoral degree sa remedial law, meron additional bachelor's degree sa civil law, yan. Meron ng mastery. Okay, look at this. For the application of the exception called dying declaration, the statement of the person who later on died must be a statement concerning the circumstances of his death or of his injuries. This is of English origin 250 plus years ago. It began 
in a story of a husband and wife in old, old England. They were married for 30 years, but they never had a child. Reason, they refused to touch each other. They never loved each other. They were victims of parentally arranged marriage. But when they go out of the house, they were the model of perfect marital bliss. But that was only for show to protect the family reputation. One day, in the description of the history of hearsay evidence, it was actually a situation. They were living in one house. But the house was constructed in such a way that people would not know that they were actually living separately inside. They had a common living room, but there is a trapdoor here and a trapdoor here. And here, it's a duplex. See that? The woman would live on the right side. The husband would live on the left side. And they had their own maids. Husband and wife, under one roof, but separate rooms. See? The husband died later on. He was shot by a musket. By whom? By the wife. But let's try to tell you the basics of the story. But let me embellish it a little bit, okay? Okay. But the main line of the story will be there. Let us suppose that one night, it happened at 10 o'clock in the evening. Uh, they quarreled over a book in the library. But I'm certain it was not about the book, the seventh chapter of Harry Potter. No, no, I'm sure of that. Or uh, Moonlight, so and so, yung book. Okay, not. So actually, you know, when the husband got the book, the wife also got the book. There was no light. Walang kuryente ng unang panahon, eh. Sulo lang na maliit, eh. That was the first mistake. They saw each other in a dark place. The second mistake was, the husband said, I got it first. The wife said, I got it first. That was the second mistake. They talked. Then, it turned into a heated argument. That was the third mistake. And then the fourth mistake, it turned into a quarrel. At around 10 in the evening, in the stillness of the night, of a sleepy village in England, but an upscale place of England, Two musket shots were heard. Why two muskets? There were two muskets who are always loaded. Every, every, always loaded. Bang! Bang! Silence. There were no maids at the time. Off day. Day off. And no see neighbor heard the gunshot, the musket blast. Called a policeman whom they call at that time, until now, a Bobby. The gates were open. The Katulong forgot to lock the gates. Pumasok ang Bobby, ang police. It was silent. Sinindihan ng isang sulo. He saw the man gasping for breath. Uh, with blood there. Uh, almost uh, floating in a pool of his own blood. Floating. Umaangat na sa guwan na lang. Then he lighted another sulo. And there it was now clear. And he saw his chest uh, ripped open by two musket blasts fired in close quarters. Then he could see his heart Faintly beating. He looked up. Then he looked down. When he looked down, he saw the intestines hanging by his side. Oh, it was described that way. And the lungs splattered on the chandelier. 
At saka nagsalita ang pulis. Okay ka lang. <laughs> That is the embellishment. <laughs> Then he was asked, What happened to you? In labored breathing, he said, I was shot. By whom? Slowly he raised his hand and pointed to his wife. Calmly smoking Virginia Slims. Humming the tune of Ludwig van Beethoven, Moonlight Sonata. Ma'am, can you tell us something about this? Answer, you are the policeman. You figure it out. Okay. So he looked around. There was no evidence of the gun. Nothing. The crime scene was clean. Except that guy who is about to float in an ocean of his own blood. Then in the last, ghastly gasp, the guy said, Goodbye. <laughs> He's now fallen, cold, and dead. There was no evidence against the wife. The wife was sued for parricide. Parricide is a term that originated from England. See? But in the Philippines, the same. The woman kills the husband, parricide. The husband kills the wife, parricide. It should have been called mamacide. <laughs> no? <laughs> But no. Okay. And so there was a discussion in Oxford University. Oxford is an old school. And the discussion, the forerunner of Oxford, I forgot the name, but it became Oxford later. Our remedial of our fathers came from England and they were discussing. They said, the dying declaration of the man that it was his wife who shot him and testified to by the police officer called Bobby is plain and simple hearsay. Reason. It is the husband who has personal knowledge, not the policeman Who is testifying in court? The policeman said, according to the dying man, it was his wife. So the testimony is hearsay. Get my point? He has no personal knowledge. Who should testify? The man who was shot. But holy smoke, anong gagawin mo? Huhukayin mo siya? Patatayuin mo para mag-testify? Nang kanyang personal knowledge? No, impossible. It is hearsay. So they were discussing. The old man said, the old man said, If we admit the testimony of the policeman that according, that according to the dead man, it was his wife who shot him, we are going to admit hearsay evidence. We cannot do that. We cannot change the rules. We would dislocate our procedural rules and evidence. The other said, but if we do not carve out an exception to the hearsay rule, what will happen? A guilty woman will go scot-free. And we know she is the killer. Sabi ng iba naman, never mind if she goes scot-free. We are not going to destroy our rules. We should have stability in our rules of evidence. But there was the youngest of them. I forgot his name. The youngest. He was around 26 or 27 at that time. While the others were already 60s, 70s, and 80s. He was a brilliant professor. And he stood up and said, Sires, may I be allowed to speak? They looked at him. The youngest of the group. I forgot his name. Let's call him Benjamin. Okay? So Benjamin stood up and said, I think we can admit the dying declaration, even if it is hearsay. The reason we don't want hearsay is because it is unreliable. We cannot cross-examine the person who said it. The person who heard it has no personal knowledge. So the main reason is failure to cross-examine, it is therefore unreliable. But look, we could give it a degree of reliability. Why? Because of common sense. 
people in England, no matter what their religion is, whether it be the Anglican Church, people are fearful of the Lord. Now, put yourselves on the shoes of the dead man now, who uttered the dying declaration, he said. He knows he is dying any moment he will die. He is conscious of his impending death. Now, let me ask you, sires, if you know that any second now, you will be meeting your Creator and your God and your Lord, are you going to meet your God with a lie on your lips and then go to hell? Would you? Would you? Would you? I wouldn't. I would tell the truth so that I will go to heaven. They stood up. Standing ovation. The hearsay exception, dying declaration, was born. Then we borrowed it. Of course. <laughs> you see that? Dying declaration was born. But I want you to know, look at the elements of a dying declaration. Let me illustrate to you what this dying declaration is. Before I died, you know, I was shot, is it not? Before I died, I said to the police officer who was attending to me, Mr. Officer, next week, mag-tennis tayo, ha? At mag-firing tayo, ha? Dali mo lang ako sa ospital, maya-maya, ayos na ako. Eh, may tama ka sa dibdib, eh. Okay lang yan. Mawawala yan, hihilom yan. Iba ko, eh. There is no consciousness of impending death. You get my point? You don't have to ask him, are you conscious of an impending death? Binabasa mo ang rules of court? It can be known circumstantially. Okay? Look at this. Alam niyang mamamatay na siya talaga. Sir, bahala na kayo sa anak ko. Ano? Ilan taon yung anak mo? Three years old lang eh. Ang nanay, patay na rin po ang nanay nun nakalulo ng butiki na matay. Okay. Eh, sinong bumaril sa'yo? Hindi ko makitang mabuti. Look. Eh, bago po ako mamatay, sasabihin ko sa inyo, na yung isang batang alaga ko, ay hindi ko tunay na anak. Yun, three years old lang. Anak ko yun kay nena na kapitbahay ko. Kaya na rin pong bahala patay. Is that a dying declaration? As an exception to the hearsay rule? The answer is no. This statement has nothing to do with the circumstances of his death. Okay. Next. Conscious of impending death. Hindi na halos makasalita. Bumubula ng dugo eh. Sabi ng polis, magsalita ka. Punas, punas, pagkapunas, salita. Ang bumaril, dugo na naman, punas. Sa punas. <laughs> Akin. Okay, napunasan. Binuhat mo na at saka tinaktak. <laughs> Nakapagsalita na. <laughs> Ay si Jose Torres. Sabi ng polis. Eh, sinong bumaril sa katabi mo? Si Jose Torres po. Kanina pa siya patay dahil kulang ang resistensya. <laughs> ako, medyo malakas. Nagja-jogging ako eh. Paalam na po ah. See you later. Ngumiti pa. Tapos, lungay ngayon na. Wala na. Dying declaration. With respect to his own death, it is a dying declaration. With respect to the other one, it's not a dying declaration because it's not about his death. It's about the death of someone else. But if his statement was uttered immediately after the shooting, that is admissible as part of the rest geste, a statement uttered immediately after a startling occurrence or event, that is section 42. Why? Because there is an indicia of reliability. 
when you describe an event immediately before it happens or immediately after or during the occurrence of the event, the mind has no chance to fabricate. Bira mo andito ako sa bintana, kunyari, oh, wala na palang bintana. Last year, may bintana yan eh. Kaya magandang tumingin sa labas. Okay, ngayon wala. Kunyari, may bintana. Tumitingin ako dyan, nagpapahinga tayo. Sinabi ko, Hoy, si Dinara, tinututukan si attorney sa baban. Maya maya, bang, bang, bang. I was describing the event as it was happening. Sino ang dapat mag-testify tungkol sa nangyari? Ako. Dahil sa ako ay may personal knowledge. Is it not? Eh pero, nasa abroad na ako, hindi niyo ako mahanap. Siya ang nakarinig. Pwede ba siya mag-testify tungkol sa sinabi ko? Yes. Hearsay ba yun? Yes. Pero admissible as part of the rest just stay. Kasi yung sinabi kong narinig niya, mas posibleng totoo because I was describing the event. There is no room for the kalikutan ng imahinasyon ko. Dahil kung may nakita ako nagbabarilan dyan, uy, nagsusubuhan sila ng tinapay. Hindi yun ang sasabihin ko. <laughs> ang sasabihin ko tungkol sa event. Yan ang parts of the rest just stay. Napansin niyo ang evidence, madali lang. Yeah, madali lang yan. Okay, tingnan niyo yung ibang ano. Babalik ako rito sa inyo. Ha? Uh, sisingit ako sa ibang reviewers pag meron silang oras pa. But let me tell you this. Ang opinion ba ng isang witness ay admissible? General rule, hindi. Alam niyo kung bakit? The witness is not supposed to testify on his conclusions or opinions. Who is the witness who is qualified to testify on his opinion? An expert witness. Do you know the definition of an expert witness? Yes, he's a witness qualified by the following words arranged in the following order. E-X-P-E-R-T. Expert. Are there instances... When the opinion of an ordinary witness who is not called as an expert admissible? Look, 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 ah. Huh? Anong pangkalatang alituntunin? 2006 bar ito. Hindi na natanong ulit. 2006 bar tungkol sa opinions. Ang opinion ng witness ay hindi admissible. Yan ang general rule. Bakit? A witness is supposed to testify only on facts. It is the court which will draw conclusions and opinions from the facts, is it not? Kaya nga, in pleadings, you also state only facts. What kinds of facts? Ultimate facts. Not conclusions, etc., etc., is it not? Okay. But when is an opinion of an ordinary witness admissible? Look at this. Can a person testify as to the handwriting of another? Can you testify as to the handwriting of another? Yes, yes. Do you have to be an expert to say that this is the handwriting of someone else? You don't have to. In fact, section 22 of rule 132 tells you you do not need an expert. See? We are connecting section 50 of rule 130 to section 22 of rule 132. Tell me if the citation is correct. Section 22 of rule 132. If I am wrong, then I am wrong. Is it correct? Okay. Now, can I testify that this is the handwriting of my father because I am familiar with his handwriting? Yes. Can I testify that I, I know that it is the handwriting of so and so because I saw him write it? Yes. You can even testify through comparisons. Section 22, Rule 132. Now, could you testify as to the identity of a person? When you testify as to the identity of a person, you're actually giving your opinion. Kilala mo ba ang tatay mo? That's an opinion. Yes, sir. Look. Object yung kabila. Objection, Your Honor. The witness is not an expert on human facial anatomy. You see how, you see how, how absurd that objection would be? You know why? 
because these matters are matters which are within the range of normal human experience. Those are opinions which are normally given by us. Can I testify as to the mental state? You know, look at this. Handwriting, identity, the mental state or condition, okay? Of a person? Yes. From our own experience as human beings, do you know when I am angry or sad or worried or happy? Yes. What did you observe about him? He was happy when I saw him. Objection. He is not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Funny. Ridiculous. Is he not? Objection. He, is, he was not in his right mind. Can you testify that the person is insane? Oh, yes. Everybody knows what an insane is. We know it. You do not have to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist to know it. That's common experience. Si Raul, no? Tingnan mo. Tumatawa, may luha, with matching sipon, at saka siya daw ay anak ni Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. E an, ilang taon na siya? 80 anos? Paano yun? No. Sira. See that? And you know what an insane is, you know? You know that from your own experience? You know, who knows that right now in this conference room right now, we are all only in our lucid interval. <laughs> <laughs> and the contract we will enter into normally after coming out of this room will be voidable because we are not capacitated to enter into a contract. See that? Do you get my point? Now suppose you're asked the question, what are the kinds of documents under the rules? Ah. Public and private. I am going through priorities. Huh? Section 19, Rule 132. You memorize public documents. But I want you to connect Section 19 to Section 30 of Rule 132. You know why? Because it talks about notarized documents. Are notarized documents public documents? Yes. What is, the pub, what is a document which is notarized but still is private? A will, yes. A will, even if notarized, remains a private instrument. Very good, my darling Clementine. Now, let me ask you this. If you are holding a public document, you do not have to prove its authenticity. It is presumed to be authentic. Now, question, when you are holding a private document, do you have the obligation to prove its due execution and authenticity? Yes or no? Kunyari, bar na yan. Ngayon ang bar. If you are holding a private document, you are offering it in evidence, do you have the obligation to prove the due execution and the authenticity of that private document? Answer, it depends upon your purpose. If you are offering it to prove that it is genuine, to prove it is authentic, you have to prove its due execution and authenticity. But if you are not proving it as authentic, you only have to identify it. Look at this. May napulot akong dokumento eh. Did of sale daw ito? I-offer mo in evidence, ang napulot mo. You only have to identify it. Pero pag sinabi mo, itong deed of sale, itong tunay na deed of sale, ay approve mo ang due execution, and authenticity, because you are offering it as authentic. If you are not offering it as authentic, you don't have to prove its authenticity. You just identify it. You look at section 20 of rule 132. Do you see something? Huh? Look at the last part. 
or section 20. Okay? Now, how do you prove the authenticity of that private document? By the genuineness of the handwriting, isn't it? And by the person who saw it executed. Yeah. Are there private documents offered as authentic wherein you do not have to prove its authenticity? Yes, the so-called ancient documents. What are the ancient documents? What, what uh, section is it? Section 21. Okay, is it 21? Yeah. How do you prove the genuineness of handwriting? Section 22. The rule on authorized document? Section 30. Yeah. And hindi ko alam kung mamimili dyan, but chances are it's one of them which will be involved. Okay, that's 132. There is one thing I will go back to rule 131. Okay, are you listening to me now? Uh, how do you distinguish burden of evidence from burden of proof? Is there a distinction? There is. By the way, is burden of proof in a civil case on the plaintiff? Who has the burden of proof in a civil case? Answer, both. Because the burden of proof is not the burden of the plaintiff. It's the burden of a party to prove his claim or his defense. The plaintiff has the burden of proof to prove his claim. The defendant has the burden of proof to prove his defense. That's why it's not defined as the burden of, it's not defined as the obligation or duty of a plaintiff is defined as the duty of a party. Do you see the word party there? Yeah. Burden of proof is fixed. The burden of evidence changes from time to time according to the evidentiary situation. If, for example, during the course of trial, the plaintiff has presented convincing evidence, then the defendant has the burden of evidence to rebut the evidence. If during the course of the trial, the uh, defendant is showing beautiful, convincing evidence, then the plaintiff has the obligation to rebut that evidence. You call it burden of evidence. The burden of evidence shifts according to the situation. The burden of proof is fixed. In a criminal case, who has the burden of proving the guilt of an accused? The guilt of an accused? The prosecution. What is the quantum of evidence applicable in a criminal case according to Rule 133? Beyond reasonable doubt. When you define reasonable doubt, you must have the key word in the definition. What is that? Moral certainty in Rule 133. In a civil case, what is the quantum of evidence? Preponderance of evidence. What key word should be present in your definition? Superior weight of evidence. Beautiful. Bravo, class. I am impressed. What is the quantum of evidence generally in an administrative proceeding? Substantial evidence. The key word, the last part, adequate to support a conclusion. What is the quantum of evidence that is used by the courts and not found in the rules? Clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing evidence is usually used to rebut a presumption. It is also used in bail hearings, in extradition cases and other bail hearings. It is also used in disbarment and suspensions of attorneys. Clear and convincing evidence. It is not found in the rules. Only the Supreme Court knows when to use it. Description in the case of government of Hong Kong versus Olalia Jr. April 19, 2007. Clear and convincing evidence is a quantum of evidence lower than proof beyond reasonable doubt, but higher than preponderance of evidence. It lies in the middle of the two. 
It is there in a state of suspended animation. See? Do not write those words. This is proof beyond reasonable doubt. This is preponderance of evidence. This is proof beyond reasonable doubt. This is preponderance of evidence. Clear and convincing evidence lies in the demarcation line between the north and the south. The demarcation line that separates North and South Korea, North and South Vietnam. There is no more North and South Vietnam. Now, what are the two conclusive presumptions under the rules? What rule is it? 131, Section 2. Could you help me? Yes, okay. You want to memorize it? Yes. You cannot memorize it? You are only asked one presumption? Do you notice one thing? Those presumptions are based on the doctrine of estoppel. When you say something, you are just a tenant, you cannot bow it that anymore. When you misrepresent something, you cannot bow it that anymore. So, yan ang origin ng corporation by estoppel at saka partnership by estoppel. You get my point? Yan. Is there a presumption that a contract has a cost or a consideration? Yes, there in section 3. Is there a presumption that a police officer has performed his duty regularly? Yes. Is there a presumption that when a receipt of a prior installment is there, of a later installment is there, prior installments have been paid? Yes. Where do you find them? Those are substantive law presumptions. So look at them one by one. That has never been asked, but just look at it. Now, next question. Why are you going to make objections in a trial? Oh, that was asked once. To keep out from the record inadmissible evidence. You also have to object. Why? In order to avoid a waiver of evidence that is inadmissible, remember? An evidence that is inadmissible, if not objected to, is deemed waived. Is it not? Remember that. Now, what is the stage we call offer of evidence? When I ask that the evidence is identified as Exhibit A, that is not the offer. That is only the identification. The formal offer is made at the end with respect to objects and documents. You listen to this. It has to be made because the identification of a document or object as Exhibit A is not an offer. The court will not consider it. Remember Section 34 of your Rule 132. The court shall consider no evidence which has not been formally offered. So you make a formal offer. It is like this. Your Honor, I have no more witnesses to present. Please allow this representation, Your Honor, to excitedly make, Alicinio, excitedly, to make a formal offer of exhibits. That is the formal offer of evidence. Exhibit A, you describe it. It is a deed of sale between X and Y. It is offered for the purpose of so and so. Yan. The nature, the name of the exhibit, the nature and the purpose. That is the formal offer of exhibits. Any objection, counsel? It could be in writing. Any objection. But if you become lawyer, insist on oral ones so that the other party cannot prepare. Okay? Now, Objection? It is a prepared. No objection. Evidences, exhibits are admitted. Your Honor, with the admission of my exhibits, I rest in peace. <laughs> rest my case, okay? That's the formal offer of evidence. You call it the offer of evidence. Okay. If your evidence is disregarded by the court, rendered inadmissible, do not panic. You say, inasmuch as your honor, my exhibits were not admitted, allow me, your honor, 
to have them attached to the records of the case and make a tender of excluded evidence. So it will still be part of the records. Section 40. Okay? So that later on, the court will understand on appeal that the lower court has committed a mistake. Oh, you get my point? Okay. Sir, suppose it is an oral evidence, a testimony that was excluded. The court said, Mr. Witness, you cannot testify. Your Honor, since you did not allow my, since your Honor did not allow my client to testify, please allow me, Your Honor, to make a tender of excluded evidence. By the way, the tender of excluded evidence is jurisprudentially called an offer of proof. It is not offer of evidence. Offer of evidence is the formal offer of exhibits. Offer of proof is section 40, tender of excluded evidence. You might be asked the distinction between offer of evidence and offer of proof. Offer of proof is offering an evidence that has been excluded. Okay, you say, Your Honor, in as much as my witness was not allowed to testify, please allow me to make a formal offer of the testimony of my witness. If my witness is allowed to testify, he will testify on the following matters. Okay? That on so-and-so, that on so-and-so, mas maganda pa. Kasi ang lawyer ang magsasabi ng dapat sabihin ng witness na hindi pinatestify. Walang cross-examination dyan. Hineram natin to sa Amerikano. Sa Amerikano, iba. Masyadong detalye to the point na matatawa ka. Your Honor, please allow me to make a tender of excluded evidence. Had my witness been asked to testify and allowed to testify, the following would be the questions. Nakikita ko yung boss ko. Pagalaw-galaw pe. Sa California, ganito siya. I would have asked the question, the first is, would you please state your name and other relevant personal circumstances? The witness would have answered so and so, Lilipat. I am Donald Hartfelder, 41 years old, a resident of 1369 Barbara Ann Beverly Hills, CA 90210. The next question, Your Honor, would have been, do you remember where you were on such and such date? He would have answered, yes, sir. The next question would have been, what happened on that date and time? He would have answered. So, parang toto. Yan. Sa atin hindi. Pwede na ang summary. So, when your evidence is excluded, do not panic. Why? You can make an offer of proof, which is called in the rules a standard of excluded evidence. I wish you good luck in your review. I will see you again anytime now. Okay, bye-bye.